chapter 6, and we're going to actually start off by reading verses 46 <coughs> through 49. And the Lord says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that hears and does not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So the Lord wants to know, I titled this morning's message, uh, actually I, had, I didn't come up with this title, it's the words to a certain hymn, it says, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is seeking sand, all other ground is seeking sand. The Lord wanted to know, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do according to what my word says to do. And the word Lord literally means to be master or to have supremacy. And so that's part of what I was praying this morning, that Jesus would have preeminence in our life, that he would be supreme, that he would be the master. Amen. That we would come to the realization that it's it can't just be about the hearing of the word, but it also has to be about the doing of the word, you know, we all know that Jesus was a carpenter, and so it shouldn't be that surprising that he would use houses and foundations as an illustration to describe spiritual things. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about the fact that the beauty of a house or the aesthetics of the way a house looks. You know, a lot of times people are like, "Oh, I really like the way that house looks," but it's not really the exterior that tells the whole story of how that house was built. I mean, truthfully, if a storm rips through, many of us lived here during. Uh, I can't even remember the name Andrew. of it. Andrew. Andrew. <laughs> That's pretty bad. We lived here during the time frame of Andrew, and if you'll remember, it really ripped through and it tore up the exterior of people's houses. So it didn't matter how pretty your house was. You know, it mattered what the foundation was. You know, now that I think about it, I actually lived on a, in a trailer. And uh, to be truthful, I hardly had any damage at all to that thing. And so one of the things that I realized is, is that the foundation that it was built upon was the Lord. Amen. I mean, a lot of people had a lot of damage. And I'll be honest with you, I was out there and I wasn't even really doing that great with the Lord at the time. This is a completely different story. I don't know why I got off on this, but I just was thinking about the fact that this insurance adjuster came out there and he was looking and he was like, oh my goodness, look at this. I was like, dude, that was already like that. <laughs> this guy was wanting me to claim like, yeah, I'll get you $5,000. I was like, I can't do that. Half the things that you listed on here were already like that beforehand. Anyway, that's another story for another time. The Lord took care of me in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that storm. Amen. And I was grateful that I at least had a place to go back to, so I didn't want to take advantage of God. But we're talking about spiritual truths that are founded in this illustration about this, right? If the structure wasn't founded on solid ground, ground all could be lost. And in this story, the foundation is the difference. The man dug deep and took away the movable dirt and sand out of the way so that he could get to the rock that was firm. Now, people are always looking for something to build their life on. They're always looking for hope and to put their trust in something that might be here today, but to be truthful, it could be gone tomorrow. Amen. And that's the difference between building on the rock versus the sand. The rock is unshakable, whereas the sand shifts in a storm. Water moves dirt or sand. You ever, I love, I like going to the beach. I don't like spending the whole day out there, but I like going to the beach. And one of the things that I've noticed is that whenever the current or the waves are really strong and there's a strong undertow, you know, where the, you can feel the pressure where that water's trying to pull you back out there, you know what I'm saying? And when you stand on the edge of the sand right there and that water crashes and it comes, it, it actually pulls the sand out from under your feet. And sometimes it can be so strong that it literally wants to pull you out into the water water and to pull you with it. And that's the difference. A house built on the rock is firm <coughs> because of the rock and houses that are built on something that shifts, they will crumble. Jesus says that it's, that it's when the man that hears his word and does his word, that man is secure. 
As I was reading through some things, I, I saw one preacher that made the comment. He said that God doesn't want to really hear our words. He wants to see our works. Yeah. Amen. There, there was a person who showed up to church a few weeks ago and they were actually made the comment to me. You know, I was sitting in the crowd and I was looking at Ms. Gail do, doing signing to the song. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, he doesn't want to hear my words. He wants to see what I do. The Lord spoke through Ms. Gail when she was signing the words from the song and, and God spoke a specific word to her, but it has to do with my message this morning. I don't want to hear as much about what you're going to say as much as I want to see what you're going to do. I'm not talking about living a life of works, trying to earn righteousness in the eyes of God. What I'm trying to talk about is the word of God going forth and then we willingly submitting to the truth of what his word says. That doesn't mean, like I was saying, that he wants outward works that look pretty like a pretty house built on sand, but instead he wants to see our hearts respond through obedience to his word. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, we have an example of this in the Old Testament with Samuel showing up. The context here is that God told Saul, if you'll remember the story, to kill all the Ammonites, to kill all of their animals. And when Samuel shows up, then what ends up happening is, is that he hasn't done everything that he was supposed to do. Samuel hears the bleeding of sheep. In other words, he hears sheep making the noise that sheep make. And he's like, what's going on with this? Saul said, we saved all the best to offer up to the Lord. And this was Samuel's response. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rain. Now, it's important that we don't take this passage out of context because you know how much we preach about the sacrifice of Jesus. The reason that we preach so much on the sacrifice of Jesus is because it's through faith in what Jesus has done and the exchange of him giving us his righteousness and him taking our guilt that allows us to access the presence of God and to receive the grace of God. For whatever it is that we're going through in the life that we're living. It's nothing else. No matter what any preacher teaches, it's not, it's not, you cannot earn the righteousness that you need in order to be able to access the presence of God. And it's the presence of God that will strengthen and encourage Amen. and give you what it is that you need on this earth to live and to walk for him. Amen. Amen. So if we take the wrong idea, we'll think, oh, well, God's not even that worried about sacrifice. No, his whole plan of redemption, his whole plan of forgiveness is built upon sacrifice. It's Jesus, the fat of the animal was representative of really the offering of Jesus because it was the fat in those particular sacrifices out of Leviticus that caused the sweet savor to rise up into the nostrils of God, representing the obedience of Jesus. Representing the fulfillment of the ultimate sacrifice that would come. What he's talking about right here is from man's perspective. It's better to obey than to go through the motions of religion. You can sit here, Saul, and you can go, you can show up to church, you can preach, you can do whatever it is, and you can put on an outward exterior of religion, but the reality of it is, is that you're not submitting to what the word of the Lord said in your life and what he told you to do, and instead you're doing what it is that you want to do, and the result of that is that, is that it's really, he goes on to say, it's rebellion and witchcraft. He expects that we would obey all of his word. That is preached. But some of the thoughts that were covered in the earlier part of this chapter that we're talking about in Luke chapter 6 is the immediate context that he was referring to. And so real quick, I got four different points that I wanted to mention. And we're going to basically go through Luke chapter 6 and we'll talk about the uh, these particular points. Point number one is religion wants people to follow its rules, but God wants people to be made whole. And so if we look at verses uh, Luke chapter 6. Verses 1 through 11, we'll see the Lord talking about some of these concepts, about the difference between religion and what Jesus has come to do, which is to make man whole. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat rubbing them in their hands. What does that mean? It, it means that they grabbed corn as they walked through the field and they rubbed them to get the uh, to get the chaff off of there and they were eating grain, whole grain, as they walked through the fields. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, so we got Pharisees, religious, the religious, right? And we're, what we're talking about now is the difference between religion and how religious eyes look down on man versus 
God wanting to make man whole. So here we have introduced into the story of the religious man. He said unto them, why do you that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? Because, you know, on the Sabbath, they were supposed to rest. And so literally the idea behind the Pharisee is, is that they're actually harvesting grain. They're working on the Sabbath hmm. instead of resting. Because to be truthful in the time frame of Israel, they were so serious and methodical about this. They would have really gone out the day before to prepare their food on the day before the Sabbath so that they didn't have to do any work. But Jesus is over here doing ministry and they're walking from place to place, and he's about to make a point anyway. Mm. Jesus answering them said, Have you not read so much as this, what David did when himself was hungry, and they which were with him? Do you remember the story? Mm -hmm. He went in, and we just recently studied it. He went into the temple, and he or he found the high priest, and he told him that they were hungry, and the, and the high priest gave them the showbread, which was really only for the priest to be able to eat. Jesus uses that as an example. They were hungry. How he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them which were with him, which is not lawful to eat but for the priests alone. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. See, Jesus is trying to introduce a thought. Jesus, The thought that Jesus is introducing is, is that the Sabbath... Amen. Is ultimately fulfilled in him that he is ultimately our rest and that man's rules and regulations are not what God's God's plan are all about. Amen. But yet the religious minded is only worried about making sure that everybody keeps the rules. He said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught and there was a man whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. Isn't that something? I mean, he, listen, they see the man with the withered hand. They see that he's in the church. And immediately they're like, oh, I hope he does it. I, I just hope that he heals this man so that we can accuse him of breaking the Sabbath. And, you know, Jesus, if you go through all the teachings of the Gospels, you'll learn Jesus repeatedly, time and again on the Sabbath, healed, <laughs> did miracles, made things happen that he knew was going to fluster the feathers <laughs> of the religious Hallelujah. apartment. He knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up, stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the others. They were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Amazing. Religion wants people to follow its rules. God wants people to be made whole. You know, religion produces a self-righteousness. And we've talked a lot about self-righteousness uh, versus, you know, what, the idea behind it, I, I used to say, is, is that it's imputed righteousness versus, uh, well, I can't even think of the right word, the word that I'm looking for. But the idea is, is that when man looks at righteousness of his own self, it's a self-righteousness versus a gift of righteousness. God's plan is where he gives us the gift of righteousness. Where we understand that apart from God, apart from God's plan, where Jesus came to die on the cross for our sin, there's nothing righteous in any of us. Amen. But it's faith in what God sent Amen. in the form of his son to die for us in the great exchange that took place on the cross that allows us to be seen as righteous in the eyes of God. Yeah. But when man follows after religion, what he sees is that he sees his own works and he compares them relative righteousness. That's the word I'm looking for. In relation to someone else's righteousness, I look pretty good. Mm -hmm. When I compare myself to you, whoever you are, I'm not doing too bad. When I compare myself to the way I used to be, I'm not doing too bad. The problem is, is that neither one of those things is like a carpenter would say the plumb line, the, the, the level point, the, the, the thing that puts the bubble in the middle. No, Jesus is the standard of God's righteousness. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Jesus 
is the standard of God's righteousness. So religion produces self-righteousness and self-righteous people look right past the pain and needs of others and focus only on what they think they do right and what everyone else does wrong. I've been there before. Most of us in this room have been there before. Amen. Some of us might be there right now. Amen. We look past the pain and the needs of others and we look only on what they do wrong. Religion disregards the fact that people are hungry or the fact that the man with the withered hand was hurting, that he couldn't work and was probably reduced to being a beggar. They were only concerned and focused on the appearance of religion. Look at Luke chapter 18 verses 10 through 14. I use this passage of scripture quite a bit, actually, but it says two men went up into the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee. Here we have the religious man again and the other a publican. A publican is what? A tax collector, right? We've talked about the fact that in the minds of the people of Israel, tax collectors were the worst of the worst when it comes to sinners, at least in their perception or in their mindset. Whatever you can imagine in your mind of what you think the worst of sin is, that's what it was in the eyes of an Israelite. And the reason why was is because the tax collector were given authority by Rome to collect taxes, but they could collect more than what they were supposed to and line their own pockets with the extra. So, so Caesar gave them the permission to do that. So what the tax collectors were were people like Zacchaeus who were actually Jewish people, but they would take advantage of their own people and, and, and make themselves rich off of the back of their own people. So the people of Israel couldn't stand them and they looked at them as the worst of the worst. So there was a religious man and the other was a tax collector and the religious man stood and he prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. Look what I do. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess and the publican tax collector stands far off. He would not even lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone that exalts himself shall be abased and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. You know, there can be people that say that they live for God who spend their whole lives making sure that everyone else keeps all the rules, but their hearts aren't really soft towards God and the hurting around them. The reason that I say this is, you know, we talk, I've talked in the past a lot. I used to fuss about two different types of churches that are out there, two different movements that we have in the church. And I mean, these are legitimate concerns for the church that we live in, you know, because if somebody doesn't keep on warning others then our children behind us if we don't explain it to our children they're not they're not even going to know what true christianity looks like if the lord tarries and the reason i say that it wouldn't be the first time because israel during the time frame of the kings we're about to get into all of that on wednesday nights during the time frame of the kings it got to the point where it was so muddied the water was so muddied with false idols and false religion that they didn't even really know who they were serving anymore. They had idols that they had brought into the temple and they still in some way were so deceived by sin that they thought that they were still worshiping God. And there's two things that are taking place in the church. One has been more so in the past and one is more, more common today. But one is like this seeker sensitive movement that's taking place where we make the sanctuary look more like, uh, you know, a club scene. Or we do things to make people from the world feel comfortable in the church, hoping that they will want to come and visit us, right? Instead of just allowing the word of God to be the focal point to speak forth God's word and allow people to respond to his word if, that's what, if, if they want to hear, like what he was saying, to, to allow him to be their master. Versus the other kind is religion. Where it's like breathing down people's neck to the point where we preach so hard against explaining to people what they're supposed to do, what it's supposed to look like. I'm not trying to say that we don't preach against sin, but that we preach a message of works. 
And we tell people that righteousness is about everything that they do. And the focal point isn't on what the Lord has already done. And so that's what's going on. That's what happens in the heart of the religious. They spend their whole time making sure that everybody, uh, you know, keeps all the rules that they think are the important rules. Amen. When at the same time, they don't look at their own hearts. I mean, this tax collector is obviously hurting and needing spiritual help. And all this religious man can see is what a sinner the man is. He can't see the difference between a religious and a repentant heart. That was point number one. Religion wants to make sure everybody follows the rules, whereas true Christianity actually wants to make people whole. Point number two. Giving up the riches of heaven for fulfillment now versus waiting on God. Let's look at chapter six, verses 20 through 26. This is part of the word. This is part of going to build your house on the foundation of the rock, which is the words of the Lord and what he did versus on shifting sand. Look at verse 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, blessed be ye poor for yours is the kingdom of God. You know, you got to understand that whenever you look at Jesus talking about this, he's not he's not trying to say that all poor folk are going to heaven. That, that's not that's not the point that he's trying to make. He, the, the idea behind it is, is that sometimes because of decisions that people make in serving the Lord, like for instance, not extorting people like the Pharisees or like the like the tax collectors did. Right. And, and in other ways, not not doing bad business because of those choices. People are allowing Jesus to be the master of their life, not cheating on their taxes, things like that. Sometimes their finances Listen, you can't outgive God. That's what the word of God says. Malachi said that test me in this and see that I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you're not able to contain. You can't outgive the Lord. I believe that with all of my heart. At the same time, sometimes there are people that even though they give to the Lord, their lot in life. I've seen some older women that that have given their whole lives to the Lord. I can remember talking to this African-American lady in the clinic one time. And I'm telling you the love that came off of this woman and she didn't have any money. She loved the Lord so much. And the, everything that came off of her lips was the it was wisdom of God. I could just and I could just remember like I was trying to say some things and even probably trying to come against the modern movement in the church. And she's like, well, brother, you know, talking about the love of the Lord. We're about to get to that in a second. But the point is this. Sometimes decisions that we make on this in this life in order to serve the Lord result in. Possibly, and us not being rich like people that operate according to the world standards and take advantage of people. He says, blessed be you poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now for you shall be filled and blessed are you that weep now for you shall laugh. Sometimes there's things on this earth when you make decisions to live for the Lord versus going and finding your fulfillment on the earth and what the world provides will cause emotional disturbance in your life. Will But God, listen, God is there, amen, and has a plan to give you the strength that you need in order to hold on to him. Blessed are you when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company. Listen, when you when you take a stand for Jesus and you begin to talk to him about him in public and you begin to take a stand for true righteousness. I guarantee you there's going to be people that dislike you. I've been having a couple conversations with somebody recently and, and, you know, this person loves the Lord, this person is definitely telling people about Jesus. But some of the things that I've experienced also in my life is that sometimes it's the way that I was presenting it. That doesn't listen. Everybody's got a different personality. You're not going to sit here and tell me that God hasn't called some people to be real blunt and real upfront. God has a use for that. Amen. 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 God has a use for somebody that's got that type of attitude and say, and, and calls it like it is. But whenever God has called you to be that way and you operate that way, you have to be prepared that people may hate you. It's going to probably happen. And I have experienced that in my life now, but I'm going to be truthful. I got to give balance to this part of this message. Sometimes, though, it wasn't just the word of the Lord that offended them. Sometimes it was me. And I always wanted to blame it all. They just don't want the word of the Lord. 
but maybe it was in my delivery. And so with that said, I know that God also wants to change Matt. He wants to change Matt's delivery. The humble heart, I can remember I was actually having a conversation with this person the other day. And I was like, you know, one of the things that the Lord showed me was I realized I had said something from the pulpit that offended somebody. He got up, he walked out. And later on, I was the Lord was dealing with I was I was kind of a little bit upset about it because let me tell you why. Because I knew ahead of time something that this person was struggling with and I came out against it. OK, from the pulpit. And I, to be honest, I didn't know whether or not I really felt like it was probably my flesh and with the Lord instead of the spirit. And what the Lord spoke to my heart was, I guess what you got to ask yourself, Matt, is what you're trying to accomplish here. Or what is your motive? Do, do you want people to be healed by me or do you want to be right all the time? And I think that that's something that all of us as Christians, once we get a revelation that other people aren't living for the Lord, we tend to have we have a tendency to do that. We have a tendency to expect people to do what it is that we want them to do. Right. And we're going to do it the way that we want to do it. At the same time, there's a balance in that, because when you speak truth, you got to understand the word of God by itself will offend people. Amen. And at the same time, we need the Lord to soften our hearts so that we're not the religious person, but instead we have a desire to do the work of the Lord. He says, this is what you should do whenever people hate you for the son of man's sake, though. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. I mean, when you look at the lives of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and you see what God called them to do at a time frame in Israel's history when they were rebelling against God, rebelling against the word of God, and how the people treated them. It was very, it was a, had to have been a very difficult time. But yeah, you, you know, if we think that, I mean, if you've ever suffered persecution for the cause of Christ, whether it be in your own home, whether it be with friends, whether it be in the workplace, wherever it may be, it doesn't feel good. Right. And to be constantly barraged by that as one of these prophets of God, it had to be have been a, a very uncomfortable thing. But the Lord wants us to be aware and to understand that, you know what? The truth is, is that if you take a stand for the Lord in today's society or even in that society, you're probably going to feel uh, the, 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 the negative effects of it. He says, verse 24, but woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. You've received your comfort now. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. So the idea is, the real sticking point here is this, is that the difference between living your life for the Lord today and not necessarily always having everything that you want versus living your life for yourself today and a consuming and attempting to grab a hold of everything that's going to make you happy today. And in the end, the, it, it, it doesn't result in what God's plan was for your life. Giving up the riches of heaven, that's point number two, for fulfillment now Versus waiting on God. These verses describe that these people that serve God are hated by the world. And sometimes people that serve God are hungry and face financial hardships. And all the while, there are people in the world that are prospering financially. And there's a temptation to forsake the ways of God and embrace what the world offers. There's a, there was a passage that made me think about this. People that love the world more than they love God or his word. When Paul needed people most, I just remembered this one guy. This is a testimony of this guy. The, the word of God is compiled. We have the canon of scripture. People read the Bible every day. And this is the testimony of a man named Demas. It's in 2 Timothy 4, verses 10 through 11. He can go ahead and turn there, but I'm just going to really talk about it. Paul is in this hole. It's a wet, damp, it's, well, that's two words that mean the same thing. It's a damp, cold hole known as the Mamertine prison in Rome. He's been, he's been sentenced by Nero, and we don't know how soon, but he's going to lose his head. They're going to cut his head off. And he's writing a letter down there, 
and he sends it to young Timothy, the pastor, and he says to him, this is what he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. When Paul needed somebody the most in his life, when he was most vulnerable because he had been preached. Listen, this is the most powerful that I know of, soldier of God that ever lived for the Lord. Uh, a major conversion that transformed his life. And here, because of living for Jesus, he's about to face death. And the result, uh, the, the testimony of this man, Demas, is that he loved the present world more than he loved the word of God. And he had forsaken his walk with the Lord. There's no question that there can be times and circumstances in life that will try us. These times are when God allows storms that will test our foundation. But we are instructed to focus on the Lord and trust his plan. Look at Matthew chapter 6 verses 31 through 34. It says, therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. What do you think he means by that when he says that? When the Lord says, after all these things shall the Gentiles seek. What, what do you think he means by that? He's talking about the world. And this is what the world looks for. This is what the world is anxious about. This is what, this is what the world is consumed about. Where they're going to get their next meal. Where they're going to, you know, their financial circumstances. How they're going to clothe themselves. How they're going to take care of their daily needs. They're, they're, they're scurrying around on the earth looking for how they're going to take care of themselves. And they get themselves into situations in all types of ways in order to do all of that. And what the, ultimately the Lord is saying is this. Seek God in His righteousness. Seek, seek the kingdom of God in His righteousness. In other words, give your heart to Him. Look to Him. Focus on serving Him. Focus on allowing Him to be the master. The supremacy in your life. The preeminent one. And if you'll do all of that, He promises to take care of you. Amen. Amen. That, that was point number two. Point number three is love the way that God loves. Let's go back and take a look at verses 27 through 36. Love the way that God loves. He says, but I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. He says, he says, I say unto them which hear. In other words, people that are willing to listen and to respond. If you want to hear my word and respond, I'm talking to you. Love your enemies and do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smites you on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that takes away your cloak, forbid not to take your coat also. The cloak was a kind of like an outer garment. You probably see people in like old England that would wear it. It would kind of like wrap in some of these soldiers. You, if you see like these old movies about Jesus, they would have like an outer garment that kind of laid over the top and maybe connected at the neck. And so it was kind of like a, a way it was a coat. So I'm just trying to explain the difference between the two. Whereas the word coat right there in the King James is actually tunic. And it describes more like the, the garment that went right on top of the body and then the cloak went on the outside. And so he's basically saying if they want, if they take your cloak, well, then go ahead and give them, give them your clothes, too. He says, give to every man that asks of you and of him that takes away your goods, ask them not again. And as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you for sinners also love those that love them? And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye for sinners also do even the same? And if you lend to them of whom you have hope to receive, what thank have you for sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again? But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful as your father is also merciful. You know, the word of God always has balance contained within it. 
And I don't really know, I, I don't know that I'll do a, a really great job of trying to explain the concept that I'm trying to explain, but I'm going to sure give it a good shot. There's also scriptures where Jesus talks about the fact that, that um, I'm paraphrasing, this wicked and evil world knows, basic, the idea of what he's saying is, knows how to handle unrighteous mammon. In other words, money on this earth is a necessary evil. Not everybody can go tell, like Jesus told Peter, go down and catch the fish and go ahead and grab that coin and then you go pay the temple tax for both of us. The reality of it is, is that money is, is, is an important part of how our lives revolve. And the point that Jesus was making when he said that, that the world or sinners have more wisdom when it comes to unrighteous mammon than the children of God. The point that he was making is, is that they knew how to make money work for them. He wasn't trying to condone their practices. He wasn't trying to condone the motives of their heart that extort people. But what he was trying to say is, is that there's a right way to handle money and a wrong way to handle money. I've been knowing that for a long time. It doesn't mean that I always do the right thing. I just got to be perfectly honest with you. I'm trying better. I'm getting ready to start slashing some stuff. As of right now, I still make the same amount, but I'm about to start slashing some stuff. I just don't have to be a member of two different health clubs. It's not necessary. That, and that's just one example, you know, of one thing. There's, there's other things that need to go. It's just not necessary. You know, there was, John Hagee made a comment one time. I don't agree with everything John Hagee said, but I thought this was good. He said, your wealth is in your waist. All those lattes you've been buying or those frappes from Starbucks or whatever. You drink about two or three of them things a day. That's $12. I can't do my math right. But ten, just 10 times 7 is 70 bucks. It's 70, 80 bucks a week it is the point that I'm trying to make. Jesus was trying to make a point that, that there's people in the world that handle their finances better than the children of God do. There's a proverb that says you should pay close attention to your flocks. In other words, you need to know what's going on with your money. You don't need to let your money just flood because if you do all of that, you're not being a good steward of what it is that God. But right here, what he's talking about is the motives of the heart and how you perceive and see certain things. And that, that you are to love those that treat you improperly. In other words, even though somebody takes something from you, if you become defensive about that and you allow bitterness to rise up in your heart regarding that particular thing, you're not doing it the way that Jesus would do it. You're not loving the way that Jesus would love. I, I, listen, I've let two different people borrow money from me that I can remember around the same time in my life. And I, and I told him when I said it. Now, now you can disagree with me on, the, on my interpretation of the scripture if you want. Whenever Jesus says, lend not expecting anything in return, I don't think that he, and you, once again, if you got something to back it up, I don't think, but I don't believe that he's saying that you can never lend money. And at the same time, there's a contract negotiation that says, so you're going to pay me back, right? The idea is more so from your perspective when they don't pay you back. How are you going to respond to that situation? That doesn't mean that God hasn't ever called us to give anybody anything. Lord knows I've given a lot of people a lot of things and I never expected to get anything back. Right. From them. Because that's what the Lord put on my heart to do. But there's times in people's lives too that you give, 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 give and you're not really helping them. That's right. They're taking advantage of, they take advantage from the system, they take advantage from you, they take, and they never learn. Guess what? Everything isn't supposed to be given to you on a silver platter because from the same point, God says that he who doesn't work is worse than an infidel and that you're not to owe any man anything. So if we're both Christians here and I loan you money and you do me dirty, my perspective is supposed to be, you know what? You didn't give back unto me. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to give it to the Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask God, don't, don't let my heart be get bitter. But from your perspective, buddy boy, <laughs> there's my flesh getting in the way. But from your perspective, buddy boy, the Lord says you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do. Pay your debts, man. Right. And I can remember whenever I had allowed one person, I had loaned them some money and I said, look now, you know, I'm not some millionaire. I'm over here. I want I'm, I'm asking. I'm expecting that you're going to pay me back. 
And then, and then uh, the other person, I let them, I, I let them borrow the money. And listen, I let them borrow money two or three times because look, just right, what, like clockwork, they paid it back. And now that person has a master's degree in business and uh, in economics, and he's actually managing people's money portfolio. Another story for now. Maybe I need to remind him. I let him borrow some money. <laughs> But, but the other person, whenever it came down, I, was, I made a comment. I shouldn't have done it, probably. I should have just let it go because it became obvious that they weren't going to pay me back. And when I did, there was, now, there was now a man involved in the situation. And he gets on the phone and he says, the Lord said, you're not supposed to want your money back. <laughs> But he wasn't right. Anyway, I didn't handle that particular situation right. What the Lord's saying is this. Is that you're supposed to learn by the grace of God to love people who treat you improperly. And that's a perfect example of somebody that does you wrong, whether it be financially or in some other way, to allow the enemy to take a root of bitterness and put it in your heart. And you and I need to remember that what Jesus is saying is, I want you to love the way that God loves. Look, look what he says. You know, he, he repeatedly offered in this passage examples of how people in the world order their actions based on what they're going to get out of the deal. But he loved those who hated him. Look at Matthew 20, verse 28. He says, even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come looking for everybody to serve him. I mean, we talked about it here recently. What did he do? He stood up from the table. He took off his outer garment representative of him shedding himself of his deity. And he put on himself a towel, the, the work of a servant so that he could wash the feet of his disciples. Jesus unclothed or unrobed himself of his deity, his, his, his ability to act as God and willingly became a servant so that he could serve us through the point of death. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It says, God commends his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, it's hard to show love for someone that hurts you or does wrong to you. The natural tendency is to retaliate, but Jesus died for our sin when we were against him. I think of the fact that I always think of that when I think of the Lord dying. I think this thing, this whole scene rushes through my mind where they blindfolded him and they slapped him in the face and they pulled the beard out of his face. And then they took, they had like a, uh, they had the crown of thorns already on him and they took a stick and they smacked him on the head. And then they said, hey, you son of man, prophesy who it is that hits you because he was blindfolded and he couldn't see. And then you fast forward a little bit in the story and Jesus is hanging on the cross and they're making fun of him. Oh, he's going to save the world. He can't even get himself off the cross. And they're doing all of these things and saying all of these things. And his response is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he's dying for them right there, dying on the cross to save them from their sin and Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. When we were our worst, it's as though, it's as though what he's saying right there is, is that we're the ones that did that to him. We didn't pull his beard out. I get that. We didn't mock. We didn't, well, we might have mocked him. We didn't necessarily hit him with the stick. But whatever it was that we did when we were our worst against God is when Jesus died for us right at that moment in time. I wish that the Holy Spirit would give us revelation of that. Amen. It can't just be the words of a man that speaks that. It has to be the word of the Holy Spirit that penetrates the heart to give revelation of that type of love. What that means, how Jesus died for us, even in that moment. In order to love like God loves, we will have to allow God to help us to love people that have hurt us. Look at John 3.16. I love this scripture. It's a real simple concept. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That word that sticks out to me right there is he gave. He gave, whereas most people want to know what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. Right? 
when, I, when I'm going to get out this deal? That's right. What's in it for me, man? And if I don't get anything out of this deal, then guess what? You ain't going to get my love. <laughs> That's not how Jesus loved. His love was selfless and giving. And if we're going to learn how to love like him, we will have to be less concerned about what we want and concern ourselves with what he would want. Amen. This is point number four. Last one. Judge the way Jesus judges. Verses 37 through 42. He says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So the way you give, that's how you'll receive. He spoke a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? You know, I think that a main thing, the whole context here of what Jesus is talking about is the fact that the world operates one way, whereas the people of God are expected to operate <laughs> another way. But if the people of God are blind like the world is blind, how can the blind lead the blind? If the people of God are blind and operate like the people of the world, how will the people of the world know which way to go? How will they know any different than everything that they've ever known? You know, it's one thing whenever we grow up in the midst of a home and in an environment that this is all we've ever known, right? But then once you get out of there, you start to realize that just because you, that, that's all you ever knew didn't mean that that was the right thing. Once you get saved, you give your heart to the Lord. The Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. Listen, if you're saved this morning, I know something. I have something in common with you. The Holy Spirit lives in our heart. Amen. And I'm telling you right now, he speaks to his people's heart. Now, we can ignore it. And then when we do that, we become hardened. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said that the conscience can become seared as with a hot iron. When you put, when you sear skin, what's it going to do? It's going to form a scar. And the scar tissue is not pliable. And when you, like Jesus said, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? You can allow your heart to become seared to the word of God, to the ways of God. And you begin to hear less and less the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. And it's a dangerous place for any of us as the children of God to be. <coughs> the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And why behold thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? We taught this before. A mote is like a little piece of uh, that little husk that I was talking about earlier on the grain. Remember how I told you the disciples were rubbing that? You, ever, you know you ever seen a peanut shell before? That little skin around the, the peanut? That's what it is. It's the, it's the husk around the grain. It's a little fleck, speck of that that got in somebody's eye. And how are you going to remove that when you have a big old beam, a big old piece of wood in your eye? That's what Jesus is saying. That's pretty hardcore, you know? Yeah. You over here judging everybody else, but you got stuff in your own life. The decide, uh, he says, why behold thou the speck that is in your brother's eye, but perceive not the big old log that is in your own eye? Either how can you say to your brother, brother, let me pull out the little speck that is in your eye. And when you behold not the big old piece of log or wood that is in your own eye, you hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of your own eye. And then you shall see clearly to pull the little speck that is in your brother's eye. The Lord didn't play, man. Judge like God judges. That, that's a hard thing to do. You know, whenever our hearts aren't really soft before the Lord, if our hearts have become hardened because of self-righteousness and religion, once again, all we want to do is we want to look at what everybody else does wrong, and then we compare it to what we do right. Judge the way Jesus judges. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but instead he's long suffering. Look at Galatians 5.22. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. I, I say this all the time because I love this thought. The word really in long-suffering in the Greek is macrothumia, and that's what it really means to suffer long. But, but, but one of the main things is that it means to slowness in avenging wrongs. Sometimes whenever somebody's done you wrong, if you just wait a second, or you feel like they've done you wrong, if you just wait a second. Sometimes there's things in my own life, I'm telling you, like I get irritated. And if I act, and I have a tendency to do that. I have a tendency, like if I'm irritated or frustrated, to hurry up and to respond at that moment. Or at least that's a big problem that I've had in the past. And then a lot of times I kind of regret that I did that. Whereas if I'm slow to avenge a wrong, sometimes I realize I wasn't, it wasn't even, I wasn't even really wronged. As a matter of fact, if I really stopped thinking about it, maybe I was the one that did the wronging. You know? To stop and to allow God to kind of to kind of like calm me down and to minister to my heart instead of just taking matters into my own hands and automatically judging that other person. And, and judging down on them and forgetting how good the Lord was and my own fault and all that. Patience, like we've talked about, this is patience in relationships. A little bit different than patience in circumstances. Many times we get irritated in situations, right? We get irritated in situations. We want out. We want to change the circumstance. We want the new job. We want, you know, whatever the different, whatever it is. And, and that's a whole nother level of a fruit to the, of the spirit. Because sometimes God doesn't want you running. But this is a patience in a relationship. You know, the truth be told is that if each and every one of us, every time we got offended in the church, left, there wouldn't be nobody. Left. We would just be a revolving door. Yep. Right? And the church said, amen, brother. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm still here. Because the Lord is dealing with my heart. Because if not, I got up and left the, after the last service you preached. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's just one example. Because the Lord knows that the word of God offends. But not even maybe just. I'd like to think that it was always what I preached. But maybe it was just something on the side that I did wrong. Yeah. Come on, bro. You, I'm talking to you, huh? <laughs> talking to myself, man. That's why I know. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. We need to hear it. Because there's a lot of times that we can easily get offended and easily leave. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that there's never a time to leave. But many times we leave whenever it's because we're wanting to and it's not so much the Amen. Lord telling us yeah. to. We're so quick to look at others and judge their wrongdoings while Jesus is so patient with us even though we don't do everything right. Galatians 6, 1, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You know, the Lord is kind to the brokenhearted. He was kind to that tax collector that beat his chest and cried out to God. God is soft towards the brokenhearted whenever they're desiring to repent. And this scripture right here says that we're in danger. If we don't respond to people in the midst of their mess, the way that God responds to us. We're supposed to respond to people with gentleness and meekness whenever they find themselves in the midst of a situation. I don't know about you, but sometimes that's not the easiest thing, especially when it's people that I know, especially when it's people that I care for. My first initial response whenever people do things that are wrong is to put the hammer down. If that wants you come up here and sing us a song. And while she's coming, I just want to give people the opportunity. If you've been going through something, if somehow the message ministered to you or something was spoken that, you know, that you felt like God really was trying to, to talk to you, I want to give you the opportunity to receive prayer. Amen. Um, even if no one comes up, then we're going to worship the Lord together. And I mean, once again, I always say this. The time that I was, one of the times that I was touched the biggest in my life, and that God had already touched me after that had happened with my sister, but I showed up, I showed up at a, at a church service, and to be honest with you, I don't even think that I'd agree with half of what the guy says nowadays if I went back and listened, but God used him that night. I'm not saying God hasn't used him a lot, because he probably has, but he definitely used him that night. 
almost everything that that man spoke. I had a conversation with a friend of mine at lunch about the, about the Word of God. This was before I was ever a called, ever a preacher. This was before I really, I mean, this was probably two weeks after the barroom experience when God spoke to me. And I had this conversation with this guy in the park, another nurse practitioner. And I went through and I was telling him, all of a sudden God was causing all of the times that I sat in service and heard Sister Tut preach and heard Brother Tommy preach and all the different scriptures and the little bit of Bible that I had read through the years started coming up out of me. It started for all of a sudden, oh man, I got the, I got the, I felt the Holy Spirit on that. Nothing had been wasted. It was like, I didn't know where it was. I didn't know where it had gone. But when he was ready to retrieve it, he just pulled it out and it just started flowing out. And I mean, I went through the whole, I got, it, just, it, was, it was just flowing. Almost like I was preaching a message. I talked about Paul and Silas. I talked about so many different things. And I'm telling you, when that preacher got up there and started talking, he was repeating almost word for word with me and that guy had had that conversation. He looked over at me and he was like, dude, you were just, we were just talking about that. He, he, he literally thought that. I said, man, I'm not, I, try, I, said, I said, look, well, it happened a week later. I, he actually came to our church and I, and I went to go try to tell him, hey, man, God really used you. And I mean, he just blew me off. <laughs> he was so prideful. And when I walked away, I was like, well, that was disappointing. Because I wasn't like really trying to talk to him. I was just trying to encourage him. Man, God really used you in my life. And he's like, man, yeah, God uses me a lot. And, you know, the Lord spoke to me and said, you don't, you don't, what, whose approval are you looking for? Anyway, the point, I didn't mean to get into that. The point is, is that he made a comment. He said, you don't even have to come to the front. I'm not telling you don't come to the front because I want to pray with you. But I'm just saying this was so powerful. He said, you don't even have to come to the front. God will minister to you right where you are. Amen. And when, and when he said that, I'm telling you, man, I felt the power of God touch me. Maybe God spoke that to me because I had been desiring for so long to be free from an addiction. From dipping skull. I was so frustrated because I could not stop dipping. It had a spiritual hold on me and I couldn't get free from it and I kept getting up every church service to get in a line to let the preacher pray for me and every time I went home I went right back to it and on that day sitting in that chair God's presence entered into me and within a month I wasn't dipping anymore I'm just saying when God's presence shows up and does a work he does it so fast he does it so good. Amen. Yeah. Let's worship the Lord.